Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by Cars.com, Valvoline, and Goodyear. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Hello and welcome to our MotorWeek podcast number three. And once again, I'm joined by members of our staff of MotorWeek. And we're going to go around the table and let everybody introduce themselves. Brian Robinson, you're first. Hi, this is Brian, the road test producer here at Motor Week. Jessica? Hi, I'm Jessica Choksi, writer and reporter here for Motor Week. Ben? Uh, ben Davis here, a uh, long lost son of. Je- um, no, just kidding. No, no just relation. Kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the guy with the uh, amazingly hairy arms and hands that adjust the radios and heater knobs. Uh, he undersells himself. Dave? This is Dave Dorso, head writer, and I just did not need that picture, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, once again on our podcast, we're going to be getting uh, giving you some of the inside, behind-the-scenes comments on some of the segments that we uh, are doing and have done recently on Motor Week. Uh, you can see uh, catch up with all of our Motor Week road tests on our website. And if you want the video for uh, tests that go back for quite a few years, uh, we'll send you over to cars.com, where we've got like 500-plus of our Motor Week road test available for viewing. And the best thing is it's free of charge. So let's get going. Um, Brian Robinson, you literally just stepped off the plane from the 2008 Paris Motor Show. And you and, I, you and I were both there. Uh, what was your take on what the show was all about this year? Yeah, if I nod off at any time, just to ignore me. I'll, punch, <laughs> I'll punch you. It seemed a little more subdued this year. I don't know if it's because of the economy or what, but... I think uh, a lot of the manufacturers are just trying to outgreen each other, or at least appear to be. A lot of, a lot of uh, environmental uh, noise was made, but sometimes when you kind of really look into it, a lot of it's kind of just smoke and mirrors. Uh, you know, some of the benefits aren't there with some of their ideas. But uh, obviously, the exotics are always popular. The Ferrari California was uh, super crowded the whole time, and also the four-door uh, Lamborghini. The s to you know. Yeah. I think we're, we're trying to figure out if to make sure that's the right way to pronounce it. I saw almost every stand an electric car concept. It almost seemed like the Europeans are saying are bypassing uh, uh, hybrids, at least in the purest form that we're used to with things like the Toyota Prius. They've got some mild hybrids they're all talking about. And, but there were a lot of electric cars, small little city runabout vehicles. Did they look very practical to you? Some of them, yeah. I think uh, the big thing is just going to be the battery technology. People, I still don't think we're there yet. I think we're getting close. But uh, sure, I mean, you know, hybrid's kind of just a stopgap, you know, in between gas and electric. Uh, you know, if we could just put our money into just going straight to electric, uh, I don't think that'd be such a bad thing. The one that looked closest, I guess, was the smart uh, E. Was it EV or ED? ED. ED. Yeah. ED, which was the smart car with a plug-in battery system. I guess the big thing there was, um, you know, you've got to have a place to plug it in, which in the U.S. with most people, many people living, you know, in homes with garages, that makes sense. But if you live in an apartment in a city and you have to park your car on the street like many major cities in Europe, I'm not sure where the infrastructure is. Yeah, I'm not sure you could just uh, run too many electric cords out there in the sidewalk and I plug think them might be a, an obstacle. What about styling trends? Anything that excited you? Uh, not so much. I mean, everything, that's kind of what the Paris show was all about, you know, with styling and the exotics. But I didn't see anything that just, you know, really wowed me, no. How about for the American market? Yeah, you saw the Honda Insight. Any comment on that? Honda Insight, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of the way the hybrids seem to be going, a little more unique vehicles instead of uh, just powertrains on their regular vehicles. It uh, looks very much like their major competitor, but uh, I'm sure the, uh, sure it'll work very well. And it's going to be uh, a little bit smaller than a Civic and be priced uh, three like three thousand dollars less than a Prius when it comes out in the U.S. I think April. That'll be huge. Yeah, yeah that's going to make a big difference. Yeah. Okay, Dave Durso. Speaking of fuel economy and small cars, um, one of the ones that we've had in here in the shop recently uh, was the 2009 Chevy Aveo 5. Uh, A little controversial in some aspects, right? Well, this is a car that kind of one of those under-the-radar cars. I mean, uh, Chevrolet has been actually selling the Aveo nameplate since 2004. It's a Korean-built 
compact they've been bringing in. And it's actually, they brought it in without a lot of fanfare, and it's become quite popular, actually. And, uh, and they've, so for 2009, there's a, there's a new one, and they've restyled it a bit. Uh, they gave it a little more horsepower, got a little bump. It's got 106 horsepower now. And um, it's, uh, it's one of those cars that, um, you know, the folks who are driving, say, a Honda Civic, don't really pay much attention to or don't take too seriously. But people who've been, uh, people who buy them seem to like them a lot. Uh, and it's, it's in the same class as like, I mean, the class is more crowded now. You've got the Honda Fit, you've got the uh, Toyota Yaris. So, mm-hmm. you know, where it had sort of the market almost to itself before, mm-hmm. uh, do you think they've maintained that edge that they have? I don't know. It's really hard, hard to, it's, to compete against some of those cars. I mean, they have improved the car. It's got, uh, like I said, it's got a little more horsepower now. They've uh, restyled it. They've redone the interior. The interior is a whole lot nicer. Mm -hmm. But uh, right now they're looking at um, fuel mileage is 27 city, 34 highway. Uh, We got 29 miles per gallon on our average, which is actually three miles per gallon better than the last of AO we tested. So it is improved. But uh, in terms of driving dynamics, it's has a little trouble holding it, uh, holding up with the uh, with some of the Japanese cars, uh, but it's uh, like I said, it's one of those cars that people people seem to like, even though a lot of folks, you know, might say the car guys um, might kind of look you know look down on it a little bit. I do like the Aveo Five, the new five door. I think it's a very useful little vehicle, and 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 the Aveos in general are fairly inexpensive. And if oh, you yeah. you know if you find that the dealers are trying to uh, put a lot of markup on things like uh, a Honda Fit. It's certainly, or a Yaris is certainly an alternative. Us, oh, sure, anybody it's twelve thousand dollars. Yeah, I mean, which you, is very you get reasonable. It, even the top model is fourteen, little over fourteen grand. I mean, that's that's hard to beat. Ben, you crawled in and out of the Aveos. I did. I've always been a sucker for old economy boxes, <clears throat> as you can tell by my. Subaru GL out in the parking lot. <laughs> you mean the one that uh, the painted with a roller? 89 vintage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's always a place for economy boxes. I, I, had, a, I had a blast growing up in uh, a friend of mine's dad's Ford Fiesta. We used to take it out and uh, do a lot of off-roading with it, despite its two-wheel drive status. But <laughs> Did his dad know? <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't at all. The, I mean, the VO the is great. I mean, it's, it's amazing how these economy boxes have... Uh, the fit and finish and material quality mm-hmm. inside and out has has come a long way. It's it's great to see them. Keep them coming. Jesse, you've got a growing family. Do these small subcompacts appeal to you at all? Not much. Not much. They don't do much for me. If I want to run out and run some errands, they're perfect. If I want to try to cram a family of four in there, no, not doing it. So they're they're the car to have around for the short trips, you know, the save fuel, actually where you would save it the most in city traffic? I think so. I think that's their appeal. Yeah. Brian? Competition is just getting really fierce in this category. You know, five, six years ago, we are talking about, you know, all the SUVs coming out, but you know, subcompacts are where it's at now, and I'm not sure that uh, the Veo Five is nice. So I'm not sure it has the kind of uh, the features that a lot of these Japanese are, uh, companies are putting in the cars with the nav and stuff like that. That I'm not sure they can really keep up. It does seem to be like the competition in the small, either compact and also mini compact segments are just going to get more and more intense as uh, people's concerns continue about fuel economy. Jesse, let me go back to you. Speaking of cramming things in cars, you just basically have done a lot of investigation on something that soon you're going to be into, and that's uh, booster seats for your children. Yeah, I think it's the the big transition for parents um, when their children are getting out of the car seats, but a lot of the parents make them too quickly, uh, much quicker than they should. As a matter of fact, um, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety just did their first evaluation, believe it or not, of booster seats. And out of 41 tested, 13 of them came up not recommended at all. That's hmm. almost like saying they were better just sitting in the in the seat belts themselves. The problem is that the boosters only elevate the child. It's the seat belt fit that is what, what's really key. The here. regular seat belt that the, that's in the car it's for the, the adults. It's the adult seat belt to fit better. And if that's not adjusted properly, it doesn't matter what the booster seat is. If that seat belt's not, not adjusted properly, it's not going to do its job to protect that child. Um, there's a list now on the IHS website that you can check to see where your booster rates. What they're saying is, because seatbelt fit is key here, it's not that you should run out and buy the best one that they put on the top of the list. 
refit the seat that you have. Make sure that it's not in, you know, a lot of people make the mistake of putting it across the, the, the belly of the child, the abdomen of the child. It needs to go across the thighs. The belt. The, the belt, the shoulder belt needs to come up above the shoulder. It doesn't need to be the most comfortable fit. It me- needs to be the most safe fit for the child. And uh, it's IIHS.org, I believe. That's right. And that they've not done this before. This is the this first time. This is the time. first time, believe it or not. And this is a huge deal for a lot of parents who, you know, unfortunately, a lot of us battle that the child doesn't want to be in the baby seat, as they call right. it anymore. And they, they jump to put them in this booster. But, you know, it a child should be really restrained to that to that. Uh, that child seat, that child restraint seat, until they've reached about four years old or 40 pounds. Mm, very good advice, and it's kind of amazing that this area hasn't been looked at by uh, safety experts that much before. Yeah, well, I think now they're going to start paying attention. This mm. is a big wake-up call for manufacturers and parents alike. Speaking of big wake-up calls for manufacturers, uh, truck manufacturers, the truck market has been somewhat in disarray since fuel started getting up towards 4 bucks a gallon. And then we saw late summer uh, sales rebound largely because they were discounting uh, full-size pickup trucks at some brands by 40 and 50 percent. And now we've got two new full-size pickup trucks for 2009. One is the new Ford F-150, the bestseller. And the other one, though, that we're going to talk about today is the 2009 Dodge Ram. And Ben, this is a truck really with a difference, isn't it? Um, There has been a lot of work that went into this truck, um, and I haven't used the words beautiful truck to describe anything since the early 70s Chevys and GMCs, but when I first laid eyes on this thing, I used the words beautiful truck. Uh, And then I jumped in it, and the handling in this truck, the, the steering feel is so quick it just dwarfs the in, and the truck. It, I mean, it's a full size truck. Don't get me wrong, but from behind the wheel, it feels uh, dare I say sports car. And we always think, yeah, you know, I can. I think we've used the word numb and and uh, slow to respond with probably every pickup truck test we've almost ever done. It's shocking when you get into it. It it really is. It's you don't want to get out of it. But a lot of work has been done aerodynamically to improve fuel economy in every way, uh, every gap and uh, and surface that was an issue on the previous model has been uh, smoothed out and taken care of. Uh, ergonomics, too, they'll blow you away as well. I'm used to getting into um, the older Dodge that we had and uh, throwing my back out trying to adjust the rear view mirror. And uh, everything's within an arm's length reach. And... Um, and even the even stereo controls and everything are, are easy to use. Uh, coil sing, co- um, excuse me, coil spring suspension in the rear is unbelievable. Um, and that hasn't been done on a pickup truck since I think uh, Chevy did it in the early '70s. Back to the early '70s, Chevy. Yeah. yeah. Um, broken roads, uh, rough highways, and everything just smooth themselves right out. And uh, it lends again to the the sharp handling feel. It definitely that whole illusion makes you feel like you're in something smaller and w- and much more sportier. Now, they've done something unusual also with the um, carrying capacity of the cargo box, right? Yeah, they have, they have added some RAM boxes onto the sides as well that are, are lockable and drainable. They're store, are they in the... They're in the bed rails. Bed rails. Right. And, and they're uh, as wide as the fender. They're right? as wide as the fender, and they've got a, a decent amount of depth to them as too. You can, you can keep uh, whatever you need to in there, muddy, uh, muddy clothes, uh, any kind of off-road equipment you need, uh, beverages tools and they're again you can pull the plugs on the bottom and hose them out and they and they'll drain right out it's uh, it's ingenious really it's it's amazing it hasn't been thought of sooner yeah i mean ram from what i've all the statistics i've seen their core buyer and this is for their 1500 their light duty truck has not been the workaholic it's been the personal use buyer the person that buys a full-size pickup truck to substitute for a car and they really have that they've gone after that market with this truck i mean they've made a, it has a, a full-size crew cab for the first time it didn't have that before um they've made uh, i think there's a new storage uh, compartment on the inside and in the rear floor underneath the rear floor mats too and uh, you were saying for people that are 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 used to uh, driving cars or whatever, uh, the transmission itself, you grab the transmission and put it back into drive, and it almost has the, the luxurious glide of a, uh, of a luxury car. That, that's, that's not a trucky feel to, to anything inside. 
It's an awfully impressive vehicle, and I know a lot of us were concerned when we heard they were going to a coil spring rear suspension that, you know, the old leaf springs let you load just about anything you wanted to into a big pickup pickup truck. So with this compromise, but I believe that it'll still tra- trailer like 9,000 pounds, and it's got a pretty high payload capacity. Yeah, they, they made a, every effort into into reassuring that um, it, it will it'll serve just the just the way you're used to a coil spring or a leaf spring truck serving i know a lot of us haven't had that much experience with the uh, new ram uh, yet there was one here yesterday anybody else got a comment robinson drove it yeah i've driven it it's uh it should be interesting i've always been a huge fan of the f-150 i think they really raised the bar with the last one but this new ram i think is has really raised the bar even farther so uh We'll see. It'll be interesting between that and the new F-150. I mean, when you consider now that the the big pickup market has been, you know, obviously seriously declined, and you've got, you know, all the GM products, and you've got Ford, and, and of course, you've also got uh, Toyota and uh, Nissan, that uh, the Ram was in danger of sort of being the odd vehicle out. And now they've seemed to have separated themselves from the pack. And I guess we'll just see if it, it works. But should first, be, yeah, it should be an interesting battle. For first sure. impressions, very good ones. I'd buy a truck. I'm not even a truck guy. I'd buy a Ram right now. Well, as we close out our, our Motor Week podcast, anyone else have anything they want to uh, pitch out there but until next time? Oh, I just wanted to add uh, the Lamborghini. How do you say it? Is, I, I, I have to be honest with you. <laughs> I think it's Estoque, but I'm, that's, it's Spanish for, has to do with a, a rapier. But uh, I, I'm not 100% sure, so somebody will probably write in and correct us. I saw some pics on that today, and uh, it's stunning. I just can't wait to see it and hope it's available in uh, yellow. Uh, <laughs> it's, it was it's a four door, um, you know, low roof. Uh, has a coupe like roof, and I thought it was absolutely the star of the Paris Auto Show. And a lot, me, a lot. There were huge crowds over at the Ferrari California stand, but uh, to me, uh, when I looked at uh, at what Lamborghini had done, because their cars are often kind of brutal and not really pretty or beautiful. This was a beautiful piece of work. It was still aggressive, but it was quite beautiful. But definitely, definitely. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us around the table here. Brian, Dave, Jessica, and Ben for our Motor Week podcast number three. I also want to give um, a lot of thanks to our producer, Michelle Parker, our audio engineer, who makes sure that you can all hear us uh, crystal clear, Jim Bigwood, and our Motor Week podcast idea man, who uh, got us to put all this together in the first place, uh, Bob Mixter. Until next time, this is John Davis. I hope you'll join us here for more Motor Week. You have been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by Cars.com, Valvoline, and Goodyear. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at motorweek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.